We'll keep this challenge rolling, man. And Ooh. we're back. <laughs> Here on Bass U TV. <laughs> Welcome back, guys. A little technical difficulties. Glad to have you guys back with us. I'm very excited that you're back with us. Excitable kind of guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> Coming up on our first good stretch of lily pads in the canal. I feel my hand wanting to reach for my jig. I'm pretty sure it's going to. Yeah, I'm amazed at this little. This is a, this is honestly the first time I've ever fished a Ned rig. Uh, I've fished versions of it, but this is a Magnum Ned rig. This is one of JT's uh, killer go-to baits. We, we we did we filmed him teaching us how he uses this bait and where uh, you're going to see we're going to release that on Bashu TV here in the next few weeks but I man I really like how it's able to come through this cover it glides well, it, it, it seems to it, it's a profile that that I don't think the fish see a whole lot you know what I mean it's a mm -hmm. small bait but it's fat you know what I mean mm -hmm. it's it's just a and it just it, it could be it could be a, a mud minnow it could be a crawfish you know, down here in Florida, it could be a it could be a grass shrimp. I mean, it could just it kind of mimics so many different things. You know that you never. I mean, it's just I just can't tell you how how many times that thing has saved me. It's one of those deals where it's not something you typically start out with, but it's something that when everything's going south, you can pull out and still and still get some bites. Um, I'll tell you another place where it really shines is really high pressured places. Right. You know, I did really good on that um, last summer in a tournament on the James River. And you know how everybody goes down to the Chickahominy and fishes all those lily pads mm -hmm. and, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I was going right behind people that were flipping creature baits and jigs. And, and you know, that's the thing about those opens in, in a small place like the Chickahominy River where you get 200 and some, you know, pros and they're all out there, or so-called pros anyway, and they're all out there. Uh, setting the hook on those fish for five days before the tournament yeah. starts. You know, those fish, they have seen a lot of stuff by the time the derby <laughs> actually starts. Mm -hmm. They have seen a lot of stuff. Yeah, that, so, that so. Chickahominy is small. It just, it, it really does so feel small. the pressure, doesn't it? Man, does it ever. That's a great question from Grant uh, about when cold fronts uh, attack down here in Florida. How do you change it is baits? An attack too, isn't it, it is an attack. They attack us. <laughs> they do. We are under attack, man. We yes. are under assault right now. Right. And and you can see the, the you know some of the things that we're doing. One of the things that you know JT recommended that I throw and I fish behind them is a is a really small profile, subtle, more finesse bait. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm fishing it low and slow near the bottom. I'm certainly trying to, you know, draw strikes from what I would consider fish that are lethargic. In a negative mood. In a real, and this is a negative condition, right? We've got, oh, yeah. we've got falling water temperatures. Uh, and, rising barometric pressure. And rising barometric pressure. These, these, this is a classic cold front scenario. So I'm fishing low and slow. What, what are some of the things you do to get through the cold fronts down here? Well, David? for one, is, is I'm really trying to target you know heavy, dense vegetation. That's what I'm doing. I got a heavy jig on, and I'm trying to put it you know, in the lily pads where, you're, where I kind of want you to kind of be with that smaller bait on the outside edge a little bit in case they're deeper. Mm -hmm. um, but another thing, too, is, is what a lot of people don't realize is reaction baits are very good. Like, you'll see me today, I promise, over the next couple hours, you guys are going to be with us. You're going to see me picking up a, a rattle or a lipless crankbait. You're going to see me picking up a jerk bait, um, stuff like that. And a lot of times, uh, believe it or not, reaction baits will be really good. So e either small or reaction or reaction or something in the thickest in the thickest cover you can find. You know, I'm just plopping that jig just right in the middle of those clumps of lily pads. Great, great question. 
Now we talked talked a little bit about fishing pressure, you know, at that open. I think uh, that's one of the really uh, fun and exciting things about uh, the new MLF events is that there's there's less competitors. There's going to be less fishing pressure. So we got to figure that the the lakes are going to really show out. The lakes are going to show out better, and we're not hauling them all back to a weigh-in site. Mm -hmm. We are catch, weigh, and immediate release. So we're not bringing anything back. So you catch a fish, he's going right back to right back to where he was. Um, I think that's going to be really key to to really showing off some of these lakes. Grant, great, great question from the Bass University IM board. We're going to send you a prize. Hopefully All you guys it's that are some awesome. What's that? <laughs> so hopefully it's something awesome. Something awesome. awesome. We'll just cut something off of JT's deck and, and yeah. mail it to you. Hopefully it's something awesome. Because <laughs> we don't know yet what's awesome today. We're not sure. You know, one of the things, Pete, about this, this can, I've fished this canal a lot, this canal in particular, is you might go for 400 yards and not get a bite, but then you'll catch 10 in the next hundred yards. You know, it's like they seem to be in just little stretches. Typically yeah, that, where we started is usually one of the good ones, but we don't know yet. I mean, I guess that would make sense. You know, these fish have got to school and, and maybe push bait down, down the canal and stop in feeding areas, or maybe they just sit in an area waiting. Yeah, it's, for the it's, bait to come by. Right. It's really, you know, other than the, the, the shoreline cover that we're that we're fishing, it's really pretty featureless canal. So there's really not that much stuff for them to to do, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And Florida fish don't typically suspend like northern fish do. That you know, that's I mean I'm not saying that they don't, but you know, chances are they're somewhere between us and the bank. Because I have, I have used my Lowrance units and side scanned this entire canal from one end to the other, and I know every little offshore thing in it. And there's not much, I can promise you that. It's very featureless. Well, we are experiencing one of the, and it's not much of a feature, but we do have an outside We're on the bend. turn. The turn. The, <laughs> the only turn. turn in the whole thing. We're on it right now. <laughs> and for some reason, this area usually is really good. And maybe it is because it's the only feature that there is. So if you're going to fish these types of canals, I mean, we've already talked about it. Uh, you know, you're going to look at anything that's different, any kind of change that you can find. Yep. Like the pads got thicker here, so that's a that's a change that we're keying on at the moment. The canal has an outside sweep here, yep. which is is different, and and we're going to key on that. And uh, we we uh, we were looking at some culverts earlier too. Yep. Anything you know in, in these, if you if you do any kind of fishing in these man-made canals down here, like we were just saying, there's not that much stuff. So anything that's different, no matter how minute, it definitely could hold some. You know, just a little pump house station. Right. Or any anything that's different in these little canals can really, you know, really hold some fish. A lot of these canals are really good too. It's it's amazing that you know they don't they don't get fished that much, um, and, and and a lot of them are really good for what we're doing today. Like, you know, let, let's not sugarcoat it for the guys. Hey, we'd much rather be on Stick Marsh, mm -hmm. Farm 13 on Garcia. We'd much rather be there than here. But hey, it's blowing 20 to 30 with gusts to 40 is exactly what the Weather Channel said this morning, and it's doing it. So <laughs> you know. But that's going to happen sometimes, so it's mm -hmm. cool to have these little canals, these little areas like this that you can do this. You can at least get out of it a little bit, like like the big stick marsh. Like there's there's no way we could even be out there right, right. now. It would be dangerous to even be out there. White caps, oh, stumps. Oh, I promise you. White caps and stumps. That's a fun combination. Yeah. But it was fun. We were on the stick mark. Oh yeah, yesterday it was yesterday morning. It was okay right pre this front, but once this front came through, I mean, you just can't do that. That water's clear.
Don't you hate when you pull on something like that and it gets your braid hung up and you keep trying to flip and it keeps catching <laughs> in there and you're like, I thought I got it, but obviously you didn't. That's where I was right there. That's nice. I made like three flips to no avail. Now when you get one on that, don't rear back and schwack yeah. attack like you got a jig. I got the full JT Kenny just, educational just seminar start reeling. on this yesterday. Just start reeling and so load your rod up and then pull back. I think I know exactly what to do. But when I get a bite, I'll probably panic <laughs> <laughs> and forget everything. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Michelle. Have fun at your uh, office party. I, I, I would suggest bringing your laptop into the party. Set it by the punch bowl. On, right, a, pers JT? on a personal <laughs> note, Michelle, I love to party. So that might be a... J.D. Bailey wants to know where we are. Uh, he might mean really specific waypoints. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know about specific waypoints. We're in the C-54 Canal at the south end of Brevard County. Um, we're on the turn. The turn, because there's the only one turn. turn. We're on the turn. Well, somebody ought to put up a sign. Yeah, the, the turn. <laughs> this is the turn. I got to say, it's nice, though. The last time I was fishing was a few weeks ago, and I had thermals on. I mean, I know this is a cold front. I am wearing my rain gear jacket, but I'm warm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You I'm, know? Yeah, I'm, I got lots of clothes on, but I'm not cold. But everything being relative, this is a cold front for Florida. And it does affect these stupid fish down here. I mean, it affects, cold fronts affect bass everywhere. But these, these Florida strains, they really do, they really do get funny. But usually there's little tricks that we can do to catch a few. Yeah, I mean, when we're dealing with smallmouth and northern strain largemouth, they, they're, they seem to handle the cold front they do. a lot better, guys. Um, if you're fishing for, uh, if your lake or river has Florida strains, which a lot of them do, you know, when, once you get down to what, North Carolina, yep. I think uh, is where you start seeing the Florida or the Florida strain being stocked everywhere. And it gets huge. I mean, the biggest, the world records, all those, they're Florida strains. Yep. But one of the deficiencies of that fish is it does not like a cold front situation. It just doesn't like changing. Like, you know how like up north when, when you know, even a thunderstorm or something's going through, you know, on a, on a summer afternoon and, mm -hmm. and the fish kind of turn on, Florida's turn off. They like stable conditions, yep. right? Just being, being stable is what they really like. And they wait. Oh yeah. That, they just won't feed or yep. they just, they just kind of hunker down, wait till things stable out again. And a lot of times, like when these cold fronts come through on our lakes, it might not really drop the water temperature that much. But I think it's just simply the system coming through. Like they just like stable conditions. Like when you get a week where it's just supposed to be every day, it's supposed to be 73 of a high and mm -hmm. 58 for a low, they like it. And then if you get a week that's stable, but it's only 62 as a high and 48 for a low, as long as it stays that way for a while, they'll start biting again. Right, right. It's, it's not the that temperature, change. it's the change. It's not a certain number. Like I remember growing, you know, a lot of people, bass fans know, I grew up in Maryland. And uh, you know, like we had numbers. Like when it hits 52, you know, they're gonna be swarming the banks. Mm -hmm. right? That's not, there's nothing like that down here. It's the trend. It's not a number. Like I've seen, one year we had a really cold winter down here. And I remember it warmed up. The water did get in the 40s. And I remember it warmed up to like, when it hit 55 or 56, they went crazy on uh, toads and like, you know, top water uh, 
swim bait type things, you know, like Gambler Big Easy, Skinny Dipper type stuff. In Florida, in 55, 56 degrees, they went crazy on topwater stuff. Absolutely ballistic. And you would think that's too cold. Sure. But it had been that for 45. Right. So right. it warmed up 10 degrees. So you would never think at 50 some degrees to throw that kind of stuff down here. Not in a, not in a million years. With a, that's a great question, you know, and, and uh, Michelle asked if you are fishing with a one ounce weight, do you have to change their hooks, your hook set to make sure that you, that you get hooked up on the fish? I don't think so with a one ounce. And I don't know what your opinion is, Pete, but I think with an ounce and a half, it's imperative to change your hook set. I, I do for sure. And what I have, well, tell me about your hook set and I'll tell you, you know, what I do with it. I think when you start getting in those, in those bigger weights, ounce and a quarter, ounce and a half, it's very, very important to initiate the hook set with a tight line. Um, and, and why I think that is, is if you, you know, it's out there and, and, and you get a bite and you drop slack and hit it real hard like that. I believe that you're blowing that fish's mouth open with that with, big fat weight. With that big fat weight, and it pops his mouth open, and then the hook goes screaming out without hooking the fish in the lip. So I think when you get a bite with a big, a big heavy weighted, you know, whether it's a Texas rig or a jig or whatever, you need to quickly but reel up the slack and start from your rod level with the water. And I still pull hard. But I, I start it from, a, from a, a tight line. Not necessarily a super tight line, like you don't want the fish to feel you, mm -hmm. but, but you definitely want to initiate the whole swing, so to speak, the whole hook set with a tight line. And I agree with you, JT. And Michelle, uh, I know you were watching yesterday, but go back to yesterday's live footage, uh, maybe three quarters of the way through yesterday's live. It, what 27 minutes 57 in 57 minutes. minutes in go to that all you guys go to 57 minutes and you can see JT's hooks at exactly what he just described you will see it in action uh, within that was an ounce and a half right? ounce and a half yeah um, in a mat in a hydrilla mixed vegetation mat and you can watch exact I mean it was textbook uh, technique performance how he set the hook how, how you lean on that fish and allowed the mat to separate and pulled that fish up and out and clear. It, it, was, uh, it was well executed and it's all right there for you. You can see that. But that's a great question, Michelle. Thanks for staying with us. Michelle gets a prize. Ta-da! <laughs> well, I see, I see a lot of the stuff that I wrestle with down here. And, and when I say wrestle, I mean it. Like the alligator grass, Oh yeah. And the, some of the Kissimmee real thick stuff. One of the problems that I've had in Florida fishing is do you set the hook and hold and go in after them? Or do you try to get that fish up and out of those really dense alligator grass scenarios? Because alligator, alligator grass is so grass tough. You, tough. Can't, you can't break it, you it, know? Yeah, it, it's, I've lost a lot of fish in, in gator grass. It's, it's definitely tough. Um, most of the time in the softer grasses, you know, the, the eel grass, the hydrilla, um, if it's a big fish, he's got enough to get himself out of there. Like okay. very rarely does a big fish, I, I'm talking about a six plus, right? Get hung up in the grass. You know, I've fished with so many people down here and they're like, oh, it's a big one, yeah! And, <laughs> and I'm like, it's not moving, it's probably not. Right, right. You know what I mean? You get up there to it and it's a two and a half pounder balled up in the grass. So, but a big one, I mean, it'll, it might get balled up for a second, a second, and then it, you know, takes off again. It's, I finally had a bite. What you got? Is that, was that? Letting a rattle trap flutter down. And flutter down. Not a rattle trap, actually. It's a red eye shad. Something bit it. So a big fish will a big fish will usually get itself out of there. Okay, so but, you just hold on real, let that fish work its way through the vegetation right. on but, a big fish. But but 
gator grass, unfortunately, is a whole different animal. <laughs> <laughs> gator grass, you just kind of got to... And the, the thing with, with gator grass is you lose a lot of big fish in gator grass. And the reason behind that is they pull so hard with the line being uh, caught up in that gator grass and the gator grass won't break. So now you have a six, nine, whatever pounder on that much line with no stretch. Oh, we got one. Oh. How about that? Open Old the Pete. pads. Open the pads. The magnet head strikes the first fish. <laughs> That's a Florida strain. Little baby Florida strain. I don't know if you guys can hear me okay. I don't think my mic's covered, but that's a little Florida strain. I've been pitching into uh, really kind of keying on these pads where the, the stems, you'll see the pads mat up, but then the stems all come down to the plant root system. And I've been kind of trying to key on that, and that's where this one came from right here. Thank you, buddy. I got to, and we got to take notice that I did not receive a fish handling penalty on that fish. I, I did notice that. <laughs> But you know what else I Shout noticed? out to MLF. What else, Pete, was remember how I said you'll go for a long ways in this canal? Yep. And then you'll get a few bites. Well, I just missed one on and the just, lipless crankbait. And I just, and within yeah. two two pitches of you, uh, you know, you just you caught that one. So we might be in a little a little area where there's a a few of them. And I and I and I do have to admit, I um I I I totally forgot what I was supposed to do on the hook set. As predicted. <laughs> I was gonna let you go on the first one, but if you do it again, you're gonna get a two minute uh, non-technique following penalty. Uh, I, was, I was able to catch that fish, but you know, I've got a bait casting outfit. What do I got about 14, 12, 12. 12. Yep. pound test. And, uh, and it's a light wire hook. So it's a light wire, but on that one in particular, it's not as light as most of the regular Ned heads are. It's a little bit heavier. So that's why I believe you can get away with, with 12 on that one. Awesome, we got a ton of questions from our subscribers coming in. Bring them on. What do we got, JK? Jerome wants to ask, do they ever set up in the center of the canal channel and dishes away from the grass? More like they do up north in the winter. I have never, I have, never really found the fish to ever set up out in the middle of this. That was a question that Jerome asked. Um, I have tried, you know, throwing some swim baits and, and things like that out there, but, but more often than not, you know, this canal is 16 or 17 feet deep. I rely on my, you know, my electronics. And, and you know, I've, I've scanned out there several different times at different times of the year, and I've never even marked them out there that for some reason in these canals in Florida, they just, they live along the bank. And uh, some days they bite a lot better than others, uh, obviously, with any kind of fishing. But um, I have never really seen them out in the middle, so. Jerome wins a prize. Jerome wins a prize. Jerome I will wins the prize. <laughs> the, uh, they, they are, do get on the bank, but what I have experienced, and, and it's just what JT said, not out in the middle, but a lot of times I'll get them like where we were talking about, out off the grass edge, you know? Yeah, just like a hop or two out. A hop out in yep. front. Uh, I've done that on Okeechobee. JT and I were yep. talking about that uh, earlier. Okeechobee's canals are, uh, they're cut in like old coral. Yep, it's, it's old coral rock. It's old coral rock. Sometimes they call it flat stone down here, but that's what it is. It's just old coral. And, that, and it stair steps out. It has outcroppings. It's real hard. And, uh, and it comes out maybe, you know, five or 10 feet right off the bank edge. And, and in, in cold front scenarios with a crankbait, slow rolling a spinner bait and that type of stuff, um, I have been effective in Florida from time to time. I've seen them set up on that stuff. Great question, Robert, from our uh, IM board. If there was no cold front today, where would we fish and why? JT, I we are your guest. Where, where are we going in a warm front scenario? We, we would be on 
uh, stick marsh, I'm sure. That's, that's one, of the, uh, one of the best lakes we have around this area of the country. Um, we also, kind of a neat thing we have going on down here, we have a new lake that they've built right beside Stick Marsh um, that's even bigger than Stick Marsh, and they actually built it uh, for bass fishing. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a water retention facility, obviously, but they, they dredge the bottom out, they put a lot of sand in certain areas for spawning. Um, they're actually trying to make a, a big, massive bass factory, basically, out of it. They stocked a, a ton of bass in it. Um, they stocked a lot of they stocked a lot of forage, a lot of uh, bluegills and stuff in it. Um, it, it. It's supposed to open in April, and I, I I just can't I can't wait to have something that's that's made for you know what we love to do, what our passion is. It's it's a whole lake that's made for it, um, and that's going to be really really awesome when it's open. It's actually the the north end of it right now is actually open to non motorized vessels, which obviously is kayaks, canoes. Um, I've, I've actually seen guys out there on paddle boards, and I've seen God, some cool. of the size of the alligators out there, and I don't <laughs> think I would do the paddle board oh, thing. Oh, I did it again, oh. JT. I overset the hook, and I missed that one. Robert's going to win a prize and let, me, let them know how these people are winning prizes. Robert, you're going to win a prize. How, are, how, how do we get their information, JK? Oh, he's back on it. There you go. Nope. nope, that's the pad. pad. Okay. Yeah, all our subscribers for Bass University, we're, if we pick your question uh, off the IM board at bashu.tv uh, backslash live, you know, we're going we're gonna to send you a prize. This is the holiday season here on uh, Bass University Live on the Water with JT Kenny. Um, yeah, so if you guys are not subscribed, it's easy to do. 50% off right now. Use the code MLF50. Uh, courtesy of the folks at MLF and JT Kenny, we're giving you guys 50% off the first two months subscription at Bashu TV. Plus, we'll send you a hat uh, along with a gift pack uh, just for subscribing and trying it. I think you guys are going to like it. We, we have some of the best anglers in the world, the best anglers in the world, teaching about what they're really good at. We're down here with JT. He's teaching us how to fish for Florida strain bass. And that's what we have at Bass University TV. So subscribe and come on over to the IM board. Ask your question. If we feature it here on the show, we're going to send you some cool stuff. Courtesy the holidays. Hey, Pete. Yo. There's a bed right there. See it? I do see it. Pitch, that, pitch your little guy over there in that vicinity. See what see what comes comes across. That I you know now that you say that JT, I pitched into that one stretch of lily pads and the fish hit it both times. Yeah. As if it was a spawning fish. I'll tell you what we we've done some uh, drone footage on this particular body of water before. Mm -hmm. And you would be surprised that when you look at these these banks now you know later in the year when more fish start spawning, but. There's a little light spot around just about every clump of lily pads down through here. Is that in right? In March. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I found me some gator What bass. else have I not thrown yet? Maybe we might want to get some suggestions from some of the fans. Well, the tricks to having JT Kenny what? Hair. Hair. J <laughs> the trick, to, what is the trick to having <laughs> JT Kenny hair? It's being tricky, 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 tricky. It's tricky to rock go around it. <laughs> um, well, the first thing you got to do is you got to have uh, oil of Morocco <laughs> hair treatment. <laughs> um, that's what you got to start with. And then, of course, you got to have pomade. <laughs> and your pomade has to be Dapper Dan. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a Dapper Dan man. Yeah, I'm a Dapper Dan man. <laughs> you, you cannot have hair like this and use any other kind of pomade except Dapper Dan. <laughs> it just, it's not going to happen. Since it's this windy, I probably do have some good flow going today. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, 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 do you sleep with a hairnet? You know, I don't, but maybe I should. That maybe help. that might be the next key. I'm a Dapper Dan man. Yeah. Got the pomade going on.
I heard that line tighten up. I thought maybe something had happened again. Hey, we were talking about uh, the. It was a great question about where you would go in a warm front. What you said something that was really cool about telling your friends when you want to come down here to fish. You travel down during the cold front. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. You know, and we had talked about this a little bit yesterday too. But if you're wanting to come down here to the Palm Bay area and go fishing, and and you have the ability to be a little bit flexible and you want to come in, in January or February, the optimum time to come down is when you see a big cold front hitting down here. Load up and start coming down just during the front or right after the front. And if you're going to stay for four or five days, you're going to hit some great fishing because the best fishing, these cold fronts actually set up the best fishing. And what I mean by that is the fishing really starts to get good as it's as the water temperature and everything is warming back up and getting stable again. So really, and, and in the wintertime, we usually have, you know, every, sometimes it's every five or six days there's a cold front. Sometimes it's every 15 days there's a cold front. But, but what I would suggest would be to come down, right, you know, st leave and start coming down. Today. Yeah, like today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then it's your trip. The fishing is going to get better every day throughout your trip until the next cold front comes through again. So I wouldn't wait until it stables out down here because then you're at a higher chance for the next cold front coming through. I would come down just as a cold front is passing through or, you know, in a day or two after a cold front. Start making your way down here if you're going to stay for four or five days because it's just going to get better every day. So apparently we know that they bite the, net, the mag net head. That, that we know for sure today. That's three bites I've had that's on three, it. I know, that's three bites. And I have thrown a lipless crankbait, had one bite on it. I have thrown a vibrating jig, which I'm throwing right now. I've had zero bites, had zero bites on a jerk bait. What else have we thrown? Threw the jig a good bit. Like I said, when it's tough, that magnet head just, it's, it's got the juice. What kind of time we have left on our challenge, JK? Let's give a time check and an update on today's challenge. An hour and 12 minutes left. Hour and 12 minutes left. We're 45 minutes in. We have captured one. Oh, one keeper largemouth. I thought I had one right there. Um, we're, we're trying to get a limit today. We're trying to get a limit. JT and I are working in a cold front scenario down in Florida, and we're trying to catch five. We're sitting at one fish. We've got a little over half to go. We learned a lot. I tell you, you know, I've had three bites on the, the Ned rig, but because I'm a poor student, I missed set on <laughs> two of them. And uh, so we've only captured one. You know, Pete, I like that you take accountability. <laughs> I really do. I like that you take accountability for your mishap. And keep it honest, man. No, I love it. I'm being serious. I absolutely <laughs> love it. <laughs> but what I did learn is that all three of my bites came from lily pad stalks. Yep. All three of them. I've casted to the reeds a number of times, not been bit there yet. Every one has come from lily pad stems. I hope we run into some some matted vegetation down here. This typically, if you get some, uh, you know, hyacinth or water cabbage mats down here in this canal, it's, I've I've caught some really big fish in this canal on that kind of on that kind of stuff. But now that you mention it, we're not seeing it. We're not seeing it at all. They must have recently sprayed it. And let's let's talk about that a little bit because it's you know I read in the Bass Blaster just uh, just this morning about Marianne down at um, what's the name of the shop down there. Roland, Roland Martins. Roland How could Martin's I not Marina. remember Roland Martins Marina? The uh, Mary Ann was talking about the excessive spraying that she feels might be happening on Okeechobee, and I, I feel the same way, Pete. I really do. I think there's, uh, I think there's something in the hen house going on down there that there's a little bit too much, a little bit too much spraying going on, and I feel like we're gonna, we're gonna find out about that real soon. 
I think there's some some departments working on some stuff to maybe get get this spraying under control a little bit because there's no doubt we need down here in Florida with the invasive species like you know the basically really the floating is is the problem the water hyacinths which bass love and and the and the water lettuce or the water cabbage um, but if we don't spray that it will take over waterways like, like we have we have a waterway right now in Palm Bay that was is another lake that we would probably have fished this week that there's 500 yards of completely choked up hyacinths that you can't get through to access the lake mm -hmm. um, so we definitely do need some spraying but there are some places in Florida that they are just they are taking it to another level man like it's just ridiculous you know you'll see bull rushes sprayed there's no sense in spraying bull rushes that's you know ridiculous last time i was at okeechobee i saw half a mile of just bull rushes just brown sprayed, sprayed. wow like that i mean that's the, the bull rushes they're not going anywhere they're not hurting anything they're helping they're helping stabilize the bottom mm -hmm. with their root systems and everything like it's just it's really bad but i think i think you're going to finally see some measures being taken to to thwart any more of that kind of excessive behavior i've been told i've had excessive behavior a few times <laughs> i i i have i concur <laughs> i've heard that story too right school guidance counselor what do they know <laughs> what a you know it's been my experience you get into a sprayed area everything's dead you just leave you try to find fresher growth or something but I've yep. also heard guys getting on dead vegetation patterns, you know? The only time I've ever seen dead vegetation patterns really is in a serious cold front. Um, Where it makes and, a mat, maybe. Yeah, and it, and it mats stuff up. And, but, but most of the time, here, here's one of the things that I think, and sometimes I find myself that maybe fishing or thinking a little bit more on the conservation side maybe more so than than other people do sometimes but here here's what gets me about spray and let's just use okeechobee as, a, as an example so the bass love the vegetation that's what they that's what they hide in that's what they rear their young in the young has to have vegetation to you know to to be able to hide in so it doesn't get eaten by something and and get to be able to grow up so if there's say there's an area let's just take the monkey box on lake okeechobee for example it's a real sandy bottom in there it's one of the main spawning areas where these these all these fish go into the monkey box every winter to to spawn do their annual reproduction ritual well if they all these fish go in the monkey box but there happens to be a bunch of hyacinths in there and and a plant aquatic goes in there and sprays those hyacinths well, what happens is it, it, it doesn't kill the fish, mm -hmm. but it moves the fish. So now the fish have moved to an inferior spawning habitat, and we have a bad spawn. Right. So it is hurting the fish by doing that. Um, like I said, now I know they have to spawn. They, they, they do. I just made the example of there was, there was a lake we probably would have fished this week that we're not going to get to fish because it hasn't been sprayed. And, but there has to be some balance. There ha you know what I mean? Like... Like I can see them spraying an area in the winter time that's not a, the biggest largemouth bass spawning area on the entire lake. Like that should be, they can't, they can't do that. That's what I think. There should be some areas that in the winter time, in the winter time you can't do it because you're moving the fish and right. then they're going to. Why not do that? That's, a, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, like you can spray around town and spray all that kind of stuff, but don't go into the back of Harney Pond Canal. Mm -hmm. You know, don't go into the monkey box. You know, don't go up around, you know, inside King's Bar up there at the top of the lake. Like, you know, all those big spawning areas, you just, you don't do that. I mean, like, that, that it's so easy, you could just solve it just like that. Right. But yet, there's so much bureaucratic bull crap. I cleaned that up for everybody, just so you know. <laughs> Appreciate it. We are rated PG here at the Bass University. <laughs> I, I'm 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 R-rated. <laughs> I'll be PG today for Bash U TV, but just so you know, I'm R-rated. Is that is that true? Is MLF? Uh, is they're going to go PG-13? They going I, R or are they going TVMA? Mature audience. I guess we're just going to have to find out, aren't we? <laughs>
Do they have a delay? Have you discussed that with these people? Well, I'm sure I'm going to have some Bleeps. miscues and missteps <laughs> along the way in my new profession, but <laughs> I think it'll be okay. We like Robert. We want to recognize him as a long-time subscriber. He's been with us since the first year of Bashu TV. Robert's been with us since the first year of Bashu TV. Thanks for being with us, let's buddy. Go, let's, give Robert, let's give Robert a round of applause. Round Thanks, of applause. Robert. Thank you, Robert. I believe that makes you a graduate, Robert. You may be You're a, my boy, Blue! <laughs> you may be a master's. You may have a master's with us. I'm not sure. He wants to know, is there a certain forage you are trying to match with the Lewis selection? I imagine he means right now. I, I would imagine. The question is, is there a certain forage that we're trying to match? And, um, you know, JT explained to me about you know, what this Ned rig may represent, some of the local minnows and what are, what are the minnows that live around here? In so the we, little, have, little... we have some little mud minnows that live around here. Um, we have a lot of golden shiners. Um, there are definitely crawfish down here. There is definitely shrimp in this particular canal. Um, saltwater shrimp. There is fresh and somehow there are some saltwater shrimp in this canal too. What? I'm not 100% sure how they got in here but I've seen them with my own eyes. <laughs> but there's definitely the smaller freshwater shrimp um, that we have everywhere in Florida. So, and the, I have, years ago, I saw some schools of shad in this, in this thing. I have not seen them lately, so I don't know. But, but basically, yeah, we, we got Pete throwing the ringer back there, what we, what we know they're gonna bite, the magnet head. Um, and, and, if, and if you've been watching for the, for the last hour, I'm going back and forth with every lure I can think of that typically works pretty good in the wind. So I'm not necessarily trying to, to mimic any one thing. I'm just trying to find that, trying to find that pattern of the day, you know. And, and I think these fish in Florida, other than around the shad spawn, um, I think these fish in Florida are very opportunistic. You know, they just, something gets in front of them you know, and they're ready, they're, they're gonna bite it. I don't think they care if it's a, a shiner or a shrimp or a bluegill or. Yeah, you know. I, I agree. And then, you know, sometimes you can get caught up matching the hatch. Sometimes matching the hatch is, oh, is, awesome. is, is the deal. Like yeah. in May, when you have a, a shad spawn going on, you're not gonna catch something on something that looks like a crawfish. You know what I mean? Yep. It's just not gonna happen. Whether you're in Florida or I don't know, Lake Norman and you know, uh, North Carolina, I don't care. You're, they're on shad. They're on shad. But from my experience in Florida in the winter time, they're, they're just opportunistic. You know, they're, they're there to, they're there to feed. So they're gonna. Pete Robert has his doctorate with us on the forum. You know, ah. Pete Pete Robert is, wow. is considered a doctorate. What we do is we, uh, we assign, you know, if you're new to us, you're a freshman. Right. Every six months, you get upgraded to a sophomore, junior, wow. bachelor's, master's, and so, doctorate. So the Bass U TV, you, you you can complete basically complete your training in one year. That's 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 well, outstanding. That's a, that's an accelerated program. <laughs> well, he's he, I'm telling you, yeah. you know. Because I've been at it for 40 years and I can't really figure out. <laughs> well, I think we may, we may give you an honorary degree, JT. <laughs> I haven't figured out everything I need to know yet. I, and that's the cool thing about the sport is it's, it's constantly changing. And, and one of the interesting things about MLF, I think, is the guys are, on, are over there are, are now going to be under a new completely different format right they're going to be forced to create uh, different techniques different ways to trigger strike different lures possibly uh different strategies on how to catch fish so strategy is going to be a big one we're going to we're, we're going to see the sport change upside down potentially you know oh yeah no i think with the every fish counts deal it's going to be definitely different you know, and something that, that you said about changing, you know, I've seen in my tenure as a bass fisherman, I've uh, seen a I'm lot in trouble of trouble here, JT. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Pete. Watch it. Look away. 
<laughs> I'm on the wood, brother. We got, we got. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to get it. We got more of them. We'll just put you another one on. Or I don't know if Pete wants to switch to something else. That's the only thing we've got any bites on though, so I don't know. Watch the tip of that rod yeah. going down there. That's pretty strong for 12, ain't it? It is pretty strong. So strong, I'm gonna cut it. <laughs> We've had some bad luck here at Bass University with treble hooks in our head. And yeah? None of that's ever happened to me. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's, I made that up, right? Where, where, where have you been? Give us a good getting hooked story. Oh, JT. I have been hooked in the head. I have been hooked in the back. One time I stitched my fingers together with a topwater bait like this. <laughs> That was pretty cool. It, it, I kind of had it, and and all three too. I'm not just talking about one of the hooks. All three hooks had both of uh, two of my fingers stitched together. Wow, which was fairly awesome. I thought. Yeah, that's fun. By myself, and I got them out by myself. Were you practicing in a tournament? I was practicing in a tournament. Yes, yes. But I I I, I tried to. I got the bait off, and just the hooks were in, and I fiddled with one, and and doing it myself, it was tough to get the braid, do the braid trick. Right. And especially when two of the three treble hooks are in you. Uh, so basically what I did is I just realized that I have a beard, hair on my chest, and I just grabbed the pliers and ripped them out and oh. went back to fishing. So sometimes you gotta be a man. So for everybody out there that's a worry wart, I did not get tetanus. I did not wipe peroxide or anything on it. I put it in the water and shook it around and just let <laughs> the blood dry. And my jaw never locked up. <laughs> Nothing happened. Nothing I bad think, happened. I think that whole thing is a farce. Not really, but. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that we recommend JT's right, yeah. procedure, guys <laughs> watching at home. It was, it was a procedure, all right. <laughs> I may have said an expletive or two, <laughs> um, possibly, could, that could have happened. How could you not? Yep. Yeah. One hour remaining. Apparently I put this one down with a backlash in it earlier <laughs> when not paying attention. It's a good reason to put it down. It was. But now I want to throw it again. I keep uh, looking for those bites out here off the break and, and I've not, not had one of those yet. But boy, in this situation, you would think that's where the bites would come from. Yeah, I got it back. Great question. Who was that? Chris H. Chris. Chris H. How would your approach change if you were just looking for that one big bite? JT? Um, Talk to me. If I was just looking for that one big bite today, I would probably, I guess, go with a big swim bait. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the Punching very heavy vegetation down here in Florida is a great way to catch big ones. Uh, but I, I thought that this canal was going to have a lot more of that kind of stuff in it for us to punch. And we have covered a lot and I am not seeing it. Um, so normally I would say a big oh swim bait or God punching. Almighty. Did you just miss another one, friend? I did. He was little, but he ran off with the, the bigger bait. Yeah, so uh, that's kind of where I would be with that. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to stop and let you throw back in there again. <laughs> you remember how far back there it was? <laughs> yeah, I do. Swing, um, swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. Let him, let him gnaw on it a little bit.
And this is the key, what JT's doing is trying to keep us in the area where that bite occurred. Uh, and, oh. This time of year, they're likely to be some spawning beds and some-, some Or they're getting ready, they're getting, getting close. They're in the area, right? So they're defensive. And where you got a bite, it's likely that, uh, you know, and missed it, you know, he might've had the tail running it out of the area. Uh, you know, and that's the reason why you can miss this. But sometimes if you go back in there, you can get them to go again. Chris H. is going to win a prize from BashU.TV. Happy holidays, buddy. Nope. Man, that first flip, JT, he had me around a stalk and just was running line. Yeah. Like totally handcuffed me. I wasn't prepared for that kind of pull. You're not prepared for the left-handed reel either. I uh, no. I'm, I've not flipped vegetation for about three months either, so <laughs> I'm, try, I'm playing catch up. But I'm having fun doing it, man. I'm really enjoying being out here with you. Being down in Palm, what is it? Palm Bay, Palm Florida. Bay, yep. Palm, Palm Bay area. Some amazing lakes down here. Some driving range pro from East Texas, Salome. Yeah, yeah, thank you for Salome, that's right. Don't tell me you didn't see Tin Cup. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> the tin cup reference. Oh man, I missed the tin cup reference. Jeez. That's one of that's not one of my Here's drawings. to a finely tuned athlete on the verge of greatness. <laughs> that's another It's tin either cup. Cheech or Chong, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it was it's Cheech that was on there. Gee, I love Cheech. He's one of my favorite actors. I just I just listened to their uh Christmas about Santa Claus. I hadn't heard that for about 20 years. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Gerald Swindle was doing a, a bash you, well, I don't know if it was Swindle or not, I think it was, but it was an elf doing a, promo, a, a photo for us for bash you social. And he had uh, Donner and Blitzen and <laughs> I think Rudolph hanging on the wall. Yeah. In his shot. I may have said, or may have seen said events. <laughs> I'm pretty active on the social media scene myself. People want to follow you. How do they do it, JT? It is JT Kenny Fishing on all of the mediums. Whether you're a Facebooker, whether you're an Instagrammer, whatever you want to be on, I am on it. JT Kenny Fishing. Keeping it real when things go wrong. <laughs> my brother. And sometimes it's not all about fishing on my social media. Sometimes it is. If you don't catch one off this pad that's out here by itself oh. on that worm, everybody watching can meet us at the boat ramp. <laughs> Be there to buy all our equipment because I'm selling it and quitting. Isolated pads out off the edge. I mean, you can tell as far as right that here. pad's out, there must yep. be a, a shelf out there. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. there's something different right there. So that, I mean, that is a, just a place that one just, just has to be. I think I've been patient long enough. I got to make that cast there. Oh, you have there. to. Now what we got, we got a line of lily pads, guys, and we've just got a couple lily pad stalks that are just out a little further. Excellent target. Actually out considerably further than the rest of them on this bank mm -hmm. that's that steep. That's a good question. Who who was that? That J D Bailey. J D Bailey wants to know if I've tried the new Tokyo rig, and actually J D, I have not. Um, I do not have a good excuse for why. I have read about it. Uh, next time I'm on tackle warehouse, I might have to 
get the proper equipment that I need and try that. But I have not tried the Tokyo rig. Isn't Ike a fan of the Tokyo yeah, rig? I, I was just going to say, Ike's done uh, some stuff on the Tokyo rig. It's available on Bashu TV, as is John Cruz. And you can see Gerald Swindle working it um, live. And I'm looking at you, JK, uh, down at Gunnersville. Has that been posted yet? No, we're not, we're not posting that yet. Oh, we're not posting that yet. We're coming. Gonna, we're going to wait till after coming soon. the fall. Okay. Well, we've got Gerald Swindle out on the water with some amazing content that... Uh, I have a question for the Tokyo rig, Pete. Can we use it in the United States? <laughs> I think I think it's legal. Okay. Well, I mean, you that's something we a, need to, right you, off the bat, we need to establish. You need to have a passport and a Twit card, but... Okay. Mm-hmm. So John Cruz on the Sabine River used the Tokyo rig. Um, I, I also have not, I, that Sabine River to have a top finish. Uh, I have not um, experimented with it yet either, but I'll be. Did anyone my get on a soon. top 10 at the Sabine River? <laughs> I heard that was kind of a tough, tough go of it there. <laughs> well, you actually have to execute a fish catch. Right. <laughs> to qualify for a top 10. This is interesting. We've got some mats here. L a little bit, but they're, they're, I'm afraid they're pretty shallow. Right, right, they are. Okay. I'm, a, I'm afraid they're pretty shallow. If they would stick out at least out into those lily pads a little bit, I think we'd have a lot better chance. This alligator grass is... Uh, it's my favorite. Yes. <laughs> my personal favorite vegetation to fish. But boy, the bass do love it. It is so tricky. I think they know that we have a hard time getting their faces out of it. JD is going to win a prize, though. JD? JD. JD is going to win a prize. From JT. Right. Says PG. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Name of Pete! <laughs> Name of Pete. <laughs> Man, we're over halfway through. We've got four fish to catch. I know, you JT. would think. JK has a question. Can I, can I All right, question? JK's got a question for us, program manager. If you got three bites on a, on a med rig, how come nobody's throwing? You know, JK, <laughs> that, is a, that is a damn good question. <laughs> I'm, af I'm afraid the reason for that is the Bass University doesn't have a, a $100,000 prize for the contest for the challenge winner. <laughs> so, and I and I'm I'm with you. The, the question is, we've got a few bites on the uh, on the uh, Ned rig, the Magnum Ned rig, and uh, and I broke well, I broke it off. So I haven't retied it. I've picked up a full size Senko that JT has rigged here on the deck. And I've, I actually had two bites on this. So that's the reason why I'm continuing to pursue this. But I am thinking along those same lines that if we are going to be successful at, at a limit here. Uh, hey, Dean, I have a question. We might go back to it. What's up? Why do you think I'm still throwing a jig? <laughs> what? Well, I, I can only think that you're still throwing a jig because you, you, it, we're in Florida. <laughs> You know, there's big fish around here. I'm trying to knock it out of the park with one. Yep. But I think with our with our our little challenge being halfway over, that I better get back to the Ned rig. I might pick it up as well, because yep. I have certainly tried a lot of moving baits out in front, as you all have seen. I've probably split my time up 50/50 between moving baits on the outside and this jig, and I had one bite on a lipless crankbait, kind of dropping it out off the edge. And that's been about it. So I'm going to go 
full Ned. Or actually, what I might do is that, whoa, uh oh, Ooh. easy, slow. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Every gonna, fish counts. I'm going to open this compartment <laughs> behind you, Pete, so don't step backwards, all right, buddy? Okay, we, gotcha. don't, we don't want to have a crash. All right, we got a, we got a little Florida strain. He's a little guy. No, I'm, 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 the, I'm the dean of the Bass University. That's 12 inches, 13 and a half. <laughs> Anybody that debates that, you have to come to the dean's office. We'll have a discussion. <laughs> I think that might also explain why I had missed a couple of those bites, JT. You might have to take control of the vessel. She is blowing. Are you qualified, Dean, <laughs> to control this vessel? I don't know. I've got a captain's license, but I don't know if it's recognized in Florida. I will tell you this, JT, I did take your advice on that bite. I saw that. And I, and I, let, them, I let them swim with it for a moment. And I was rewarded. Sometimes in Florida, you need to do that. Sometimes our fish will get a little funky. Notice I didn't put a cold Medina in on the end of the funk, though. <laughs> JT's in the box digging for a. I am digging for. A we Ned. have a. a Ned delicious. Gambler Fat Ace we're going to put on here. And what we're going to do. Is I. I'm going to swap you. I'm going to give this back to you. And you give that one to me. All right. I'm giving it to you with a backlash in it. Perfect. Just for fun. So you do that from the back. <laughs> I actually got your backlash out and then created one of my own <laughs> at the end of that cast. That's just so well everybody's, done. just so everybody knows right now that this is not Pete's backlash <laughs> I'm picking out. I freed Pete's. This is mine. Everybody, everybody watching at home to be aware of this. Oh man, I got a couple isolated patches of. We don't want anybody thinking that. Right in front of me. See a couple bridges up in front of us, JT. Yeah, we do. The first one. Well, actually, both of them are I-95. Do Florida strain fish use bridges like they do in other parts of the country? I have only seen it one time in my tenure, and not much any other time. Florida strain crappie, however, <laughs> enjoy finding themselves around bridges. I gave you a little bit heavier one that time to maybe combat the uh, the wind. The wind. Not really matching the hatch as far as the bait. We're matching the conditions as far as the tackle. Sometimes is just as important. You know, like we're throwing a five sixteenths on your your uh, magnet head right there. Like typically, I would never throw one that heavy if you're only fishing and say two to five feet of water. But when you have a 28 mile an hour wind at your back. I got her in reverse. Come on. I think it's coming. Nope. There it goes. Thank you. And that's a big problem, you know. I mean, these are challenging conditions, guys. I know, you know, you're, you're both blowing so quick that it causes you to get snarled up in some nasty vegetation. By the time you get your cast in there, the boat's already drifting by. 
But that's what I was saying about how, we, you know, we're using a lot heavier weights to combat this wind than normally we would in a regular situation like this because we're just, it's allowing us to be able to control our baits a little better. Like I would have a, a 3 sixteenths, you know, instead mm -hmm. of a 5 sixteenths or something like that fishing this, this shallow or clear water. You know, the funny thing is it's not all shallow. Like where the boat's sitting, we're probably in, uh, well, I can tell you we're in 8.4 feet, but up there where we're pitching, it's pretty shallow. Whew. We feel that cold breeze now, can't you? <laughs> it is. It's. Stefan would like to see a close up of the Mag Ned rig with a 5 16th ounce. See if I can hold that for you, Jeff, so that you can see it. It's uh, basically a six inch sink stick bait. Uh, this is, uh, what is this, a gambler? gambler ace? That's a gambler fat ace in this particular. This is a fat ace, in six half. inch, cut in half on a 5 16th mushroom head, little weed guard. Whose jig head is this? That's a Nichols. That's a Nichols jig That's head. That's a JT Kenny Signature Series Magnet head. Outstanding. Shout out to Stefan. How are you, buddy? Bass University uh, subscriber. Is he alumni? Helper. He's been with us a while. So he would be alumni, I guess. <laughs> alumni is a graduate. So, so do we have any alumni at Bass UTV? <laughs> I think the guy that's a master's is. <laughs> we've been around long enough. We've got people that have been with us since the beginning, man. And it's, it's an amazing group of guys. Love seeing all you guys. If uh, you guys uh, haven't had a chance to look at our classes, go over to thebassuniversity.com. Uh, we've got classes. JT's going to be with us in, uh, in both New Jersey and Columbus. That's that's part. That's the party Bass University. Pa party, yeah. The partiest Bass University yep. school. Also going to be with us out at Columbus, Ohio, and we're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we're in Gadsden, <laughs> Alabama this year, guys. So that's uh, going to be a good one there at Gadsden too. Yeah, Gadsden really has got Brian Thrift. It's got uh, isn't Casey Ashley there in Gadsden and um, G Man going to be with that one. He's going to be there. Shout out to friend of Bass UTV, Gerald Swindle. Gee. Always trying to beat Pete's meat. He is. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> the, uh, the, the content. Oh, he's talking about content. I thought he was talking about your big fish. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't follow him all the time. I don't no, know. No, he's a pistol. <laughs> he's hard to stay up with. <laughs> so someone that doesn't want to have their name on there, but they have asked us, Pete, you being the dean, yeah. why aren't we fishing into the wind and why aren't we casting into the wind? Because typically, who? Hey now. Typically, hey now. What happens is who? when somebody questions <laughs> what I'm doing, I need to dis display to display. them, Pete, that that. This is how it works. That's that's our biggest fish of the day. Well done, Two brother. and three quarters or so, I would say. Yep. We want to put him in the live well for our for our thing. But no, honestly, why we're not fishing into the wind is because we would not make any headway because it's blowing that hard. Literally, I could have a 112 pound thrust Minn Kota on a hundred and we wouldn't go anywhere that that uh, that's honest answer to the question it really is it's, it's blowing that hard i don't know if you can turn the camera around and look back up and see the white caps coming down but yeah it's blowing that hard we wouldn't make any headway and that's a great question but so, sometimes you have to fish 
the, what the, the elements allow, fishing condition, fish the elements, the, what they allow you to fish and the way they allow you to fish. If it was blowing 15 mile an hour right now, mm -hmm. we would absolutely be going in, into the wind, but it's not. <laughs> right, it's hammering. Yeah, it's hammering. I mean, I, we physically can't. And one of the other things that you run into, and you, like this wind is just really ripping and gusting, probably 30, 40 right now. And we've just ramped up. We're now drifting at a problem, probably 10 miles an hour, maybe not that fast, but we're ripping. Oh, yeah. Um, When it's blowing this fast, if you try to turn into it, what will happen is it creates a tremendous amount of noise. Uh, your troll motor is now ripping. Your boat is slapping up and down with the waves. And, and it really can be, uh, you know, a, a really racket machine that, that's hard to manage. So sometimes drifting is the way that you have to do it in these types of conditions. And Pete, what most people probably don't realize is that I got my foot on the trolling motor in reverse. Right. I'm slowing our drift down and we're still flying. Whoo! Like I can't really even gusting. get a hold of my bait to pitch it again. I'm looking back to make sure we don't have a uh, tornado or something coming at us. Oh! JT with a swing and a miss. And it's just so frustrating because we really can't turn around. Like, and, and we literally get, can't. Where we're getting these bites, we just have to, as quickly as possible, get our baits back into a possible area where there could be a bite because it's just moving us so fast. You can see how fast we're going. I have the trolling motor backwards on seven. And we're still going the other way that fast. That's how hard the wind's blowing right now. Whoo! It's blowing the lily pads under the water. Yeah, the lily pads are actually under the water. They're disappearing on us. <laughs> I think what we have is a little squall, a little storm cell. Oh, there is, for that, sure. That's, that's approaching us. I see some rain coming. I, what, is that what you want to do? I'm talking to my, uh, I mean, I'll keep fishing. I say we fish through it. If the, if the gear can handle it, we'll fish through it. If the gear can handle it, I can handle it. <laughs> All right, we're getting, we're getting the, we're getting the, we're gonna cut the broadcast. I can see, and maybe you can show them with the camera, Jeff. We got just a squall coming. It's, uh, it's gonna deliver some, uh, some rain. It'll, it, it'll be pretty torrential here for a little while. So we're gonna, we're gonna probably hunker down, let this thing blow oh, through. Matey, oh, matey, we can get by. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got to take my hat off to talk to you guys because it's just going to go. That's how hard it's blowing right now. But we will be it, back. Is this how Pete the Pirates would do it? <laughs> With about, what do we got, 45 minutes? JK, he's not, we got about 30 or 45 minutes left in the live. We will be right back. Arr. <laughs> Arr.